morning. My, uh, my task is to introduce uh, my wife this morning, who will introduce Jody Millerburn, who is the director of the Boys and Girls Club. We're continuing with our series on places that we serve and partner with in Zumbro. Uh, some of you probably remember Larry Kent, who's a member of our organization, who was the director at the Boys and Girls Club for many years. Um, Jody, was before your time. <laughs> uh, you might not know that uh, my wife Erlene was the interim director at the Boys and Girls Club uh, sometime prior to Larry Kent's arrival in town. Uh, she was on the board of directors at the Boys and Girls Club before that time and since that time. I occasionally will ask her, how much longer are you going to be on that board? And she always says, well, we just got to get this next project done and I'll think about it. Um, so the next project is done. <laughs> but I bet there's another one coming. I'll be sure. Okay. <laughs> so let me introduce my wife, Erlene, who will introduce Jody. Thank you. Uh, I have been so excited about our theme for the year, creating a place to all, for all to serve, because I believe this congregation has really done an awesome job of preparing us to serve. And so many of you do so in wonderful ways. So this morning I get to tell you why I am you know, passionate about the Boys and Girls Club. But let's first start with prayer. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to serve others. We hear your call to feed the hungry, to shelter the homeless, to help the poor, to serve in our communities and our world, and sometimes it's overwhelming. But we know that we all have gifts to share, and when we do even the smallest thing to help others, we often find that we are the ones who are blessed. I pray that you bless our time together this morning, Lord, and help us to hear about programs right here in Rochester, Head Start, the Boys and Girls Club, where people are your hands, helping children and families. I thank you for this congregation. Help us to continue to see ways that we can partner as individuals and as a congregation to do this important work of caring for the children and making a difference in their lives. In your name, amen. Did anyone see this last night? Yes. In the paper? Yep. This young woman is our Youth of the Year. And this is just one example of the fabulous kids that come to our club and not only have their lives molded, but serve others in the community. Through the Keystone Club, you would be amazed at what these kids do. Judy, Jody will probably maybe mention that. But uh, my job is to just tell you, so why am I serving in this way? Well, the bottom line is, I am just, one of my passions is children. It may not surprise you, or it may surprise you, that I taught parenting classes before I had kids. <laughs> How dare I do that? Um, but I, it started out when we moved to Rochester almost 40 years ago, and I worked for Child Care Resource and Referral. Anyone remember what the old name was? It was, it was housed right here in this church, it started in this church, Olmsted County Council for Coordinated Child Care. Um, Four C's, <laughs> we called it because that was a mouthful. And um, actually it's because I worked for Child Care Resource Referral that I joined this church. So that was kind of the beginning of it, but I come from a family of nine and I kind of was a caregiver of kids and I've always just cared about what happens to them. I actually was a staff member at Child Care Resource Referral when we wrote the grant for Head Start. So I was a part of writing that grant, so I feel like some things have come full circle for me that I would have never seen back then. Uh, I then worked for Rochester Public Schools for, I was at Child Care Resource Referral for 13, worked for Rochester Public Schools for 12. I was the Director of Transportation among other things and during that time and since I have often referred it to my position as the mother of 16,000 children because <laughs> I worried about them on days like this. Um, and then I took early retirement after 12 years and that was about the time the Boys and Girls Club was coming to town. 
I was contracted as a consultant to do write the master action plan for youth in Olmstead County. And one of the glaring omissions in our county in our in our community of Rochester was that kids just did not have a place that they felt was safe to just go and hang, to maybe have an access to a computer. The library had a few, but they just didn't have that. And the kids told us that. Their parents told us that. Uh, sorry about that. I better watch my mic. And um, so the, one of the goals was to really make that happen for the Boys and Girls Club to come to Rochester. And they have filled that role so beautifully and more than we ever expected. Um, as Harlan mentioned, I was on the staff for six months as interim director and I've been on the board now for 10 years. And so why do I keep doing this? I never grow tired of the difference we make in the lives of kids. That's why I keep doing it. I, um, there are so many success stories. Rosalind is just one of them. I might chip in with one or two if we have time of uh, just things that have happened in my life interacting with the kids there. So you see, God had a plan for my life and for my service for my serving that I couldn't even see back then. But now as I'm looking backwards, it all fits together so beautifully. So fast forward 13 years, uh, here we are in a new place, and we have Jody Miller burned here as our chief professional officer, is what the Boys and Girls Club of America calls it, executive director to some of you. And she is fabulous, and again, um, she came to our club in a different capacity, and we just are so lucky that she was able to step in the role of, of uh, CPO when Larry left. So without, she has a little girl too, and I wish I would have told you to bring her. <laughs> I, uh, but you know, that's uh, when you're presenting, maybe a little more than you can, she'd be presenting to. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joni here to tell us more about the place in Boys and Girls Club. Okay, there we go. I feel really high tech this morning, I'll be honest with you. You know, when you work for a nonprofit, you're typically in spaces that are not meant to be spaces. Um, you use stuff that you have. Our, our motto is you do what you can with what you have where you are. So this is pretty high tech for me. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for welcoming me into your church. Good morning. Um, well, you know, I thought this morning, you know, Erlene and I talked a little bit about this, this discussion this morning. I know this is meant to be a forum which is so much more of a discussion than me presenting information to you. So I want that to be the, the atmosphere that we have this morning. So feel free to jump in with questions, ask me things. If, you, if I speak too fast, which I tend to do because I get really excited about this, let me know because I want this to be interactive and I really want you to get the best information possible. So I'm going to be giving a bunch of information this morning and hopefully um, you'll have some questions about that too. So I thought the best way to do that was to let you know a little bit more about me so I can feel like I'm more part of the family. So I do have a little girl. Her name is Adeline. She is seven years old and she has transformed my life. So when you talked about doing parenting classes uh, before being a parent, I've been doing youth uh, development programs for 14 years and um, primarily all with Boys and Girls Clubs. And I, I kind of thought I had it dialed in before I was a parent and they would say, it changes your life, Jody. You know, when you have this child, it, it's gonna change your life. And I'd go, I get it. You know, I've worked with kids for a number of years. I get it. I didn't get it. <laughs> she has totally changed my life for the better. I do say that she is going to probably um, be the president or cure cancer or end childhood poverty, something like that. But most days I really just want her to brush her teeth and put on her shoes so we can go to school. Um, so I've been in, uh, as I said, Boys and Girls Club work for 14 years, and it has changed my life. I really say that my calling found me. I, I didn't go out looking for this type of work, nor did I think I'd ever work with kids. Um, and during that time, I worked with a variety of Boys and Girls Clubs and moved to Rochester in 2008, and it has been a fantastic ride. Um, and in part due to the great people I get to work with, like Erlene, who has um, made my, my service to this community um, absolutely enjoyable. And I do feel like I'm a part of a greater good and greater family here. Anybody want to know anything super personal about me before we begin? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to talk about the place 
which is this joint um, partnership with Head Start and Boys and Girls Club, and I'm sure um, a whole bunch about Boys and Girls Club as well. Um, as I said, you know, I've been doing this for a number of years, and it is one of those things for me, it never gets old. Uh, I never get tired of the great work that we're doing in this community, and I never get tired of sharing this with everybody as well. So we have formed the place. And before we get started, I just want a show of hands of how many people have been to home school. Oh, good. Has anybody been there lately? Oh, good, a few. So have you seen the changes? My favorite, my favorite comment when we go through home school is when somebody says, my gosh, you can't even recognize it. I go, yay. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the place and um, why it's necessary, why we chose to build the place, why Boys and Girls Club and Youth Development Services are necessary in Rochester, um, why we're future focused and how that evolved from the beginning of this project to where we're at today, and then of course our, our mission-driven partnership. And then I'll talk more specifically about the partnership with Head Start and how we've been so focused on making sure that we are uh, mission-driven through that. And then of course, anything else you all want to ask. Boys and Girls Club of Rochester, here's both of our missions. Child Care Resource and Referral is the parent company for Head Start. Um, as Erlene said, we started serving youth in this community in 2000. And the typical way of Boys and Girls Clubs come to communities is with a group of concerned citizens saying, we need something for kids to do. Uh, the typical response when coming to Rochester is, there's plenty of things for kids to do in Rochester. There's a Y, there's after school activities, there's Boy Scouts, there's Girl Scouts, there's all these great things. And while that's true, you know, Rochester is such a dynamic community with so much to offer. But what the reality was is not everybody was living in that same Rochester. Uh, that there were a lot of kids with a lot of needs and there was a group of citizens saying we need this for all kids and for all kids to be supported. So that's how Boys and Girls Club started. We started in a, a little, it was an old bank building across from Cub Foods on 15th uh, and then purchased home school in 2002 and moved our operations over there. Um, and have spread out since then. Uh, we uh, do some outreach programming. We are in three middle schools. Um, we're also in Oak Park, Oak Terrace Estate. Sorry, it's a mobile home community on Marion Road. Uh, and we also have a club in Blooming Prairie, Minnesota. And what I typically hear is, huh, Blooming Prairie? And I say, yes. It's for the same reason that we have a club in Rochester. There was a group of citizens that came together that said, we need something for all kids to be able to participate in. So Blooming Prairie has 2,000, uh, the population is 2,000, and cumulatively there have been over 400 Boys and Girls Club members. So i just like to say that's pretty impressive that 20% of the town has been touched by Boys and Girls Club. Uh, Boys and Girls Club uh, of Rochester has four impact areas. Uh, we have character and leadership development, health and life skills, uh, education, uh, and academic success rather, and the arts. And so while we are a great place and a safe place for kids to hang out, we also are youth development, making sure that we are creating the next community's leaders. Um, what I like to say is if you could do anything you wanted to do in the world, what would it be? And then I help them map the path to get there. If it's doctor, if it's lawyer, if it's carpenter, if it's restaurant owner, then we help connect those dots. And some of them, I just want to graduate from high school. Okay, well, let's start there. And I, I, I don't share a lot of stats because I find that, for me, it's more inspirational to share stories, but I'll, I'll sprinkle a few in there. Um, <clears throat> when surveyed uh, across the country, Boys and Girls Club members were asked, um, what has Boys and Girls Club done for you? And 57% 50, of those said, Boys and Girls Club saved my life. So that's pretty powerful to look at what that means. And some that means that we set them on the path to success, and some that means it was the safest place for me to be growing up, and I don't know that I would have survived without it. So that's a little bit about Boys and Girls Club. Um, and nationally, Boys and Girls Clubs have been around for well over 100 years, so we're still pretty young. Um, I think I, I probably have to stop saying that after a couple of years. I don't know when yet, but it's kind of like dog years, you know? You're, you, it's not really year for year. Uh, Head Start, um, Child Care Resource and Referral has been in this community for over 40 years. Head Start has been here for 25 years. Um, it is a, a federally funded program that helps get kids ready for school. Um, Head Start started an early Head Start program a couple of years ago with the promise of the place, knowing that they were going to expand. Um, and so they, it is social, emotional, educational development, really getting kids ready to be in the classroom. Um, they have one stat, this is just their, their most recent one, that when they had uh, 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 surveyed or um, 
tested kids coming into the Head Start program, 44% of those kids were proficient, meaning ready to learn, ready to enter the classroom, know how to open a book, know how to sit in a line, raise their hand, know their colors, all of that stuff. By the end of their time in Head Start, 88% of those kids were proficient, meaning ready to learn and ready to access all of the great programs. Now what that means for me as a parent is when my child's in kindergarten next to another kid in kindergarten, that 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 teacher doesn't have to focus all of her attention on those kids that aren't ready to learn, that everybody gets the same amount of attention. So it's powerful as a community member and, and as, a, as a parent, but it's also really powerful for those kids that are truly given that, that step up. Oh, so here's a story. Um, this is a little bit self-serving because it's a picture of me, but this is um, Stephanie. Stephanie is my little sister. I met Stephanie at Boys and Girls Club. Uh, of St. Cloud, I don't know how many years ago, again, dog years. It's probably been 13, 14 years now. Um, and we quickly uh, grew very close. Uh, because Boys and Girls Club does not do anything in the community, we're all very site-based. Uh, I decided to become, well, we decided to become big sister, little sister. So she is my little sister. Um, and in every sense of the word, my daughter calls her auntie. She comes to Thanksgiving, Christmas. My sister consider, my sisters consider her a sister. So she truly is a part of our family. Um, she came down for the grandest opening celebration, which is when this picture was taken to be a part of that as well. Uh, uh, while I won't get into Stephanie's entire story, happy to share it with you. And uh, at the end, if you're interested, what I wanted to share was a piece of information. How many people are on Facebook? Anybody, a few people? Well, there's this thing on Facebook these days where you can post X amount of things that people didn't know about you. You know, post 11 things people don't know, seven things people don't know. Yeah. Well, Stephanie did that, and this is, while you don't have to read them all, this is what Stephanie posted November 18th of this year. And if you look at the number three one, she said, Boys and Girls Club saved my life. And she absolutely means that. Without Boys and Girls Club, Stephanie would not be where she is today, which is gainfully employed as marketing assistant at Minnesota Department of Transportation with a fully funded four-year degree from St. Thomas University. So Stephanie is one of those success stories that I'm very proud of. I better make sure it's all clean language in there because she is only 25. <laughs> um, so that, that's why we do what we do. And that's why I never get tired of doing what we do. With youth development, the, the problem that we have is that there's very rarely immediate gratification. <laughs> it takes a really long time to get to these points. Um, and I was thinking about this and I was struggling with what to call Stephanie. Uh, because to me she's still a club kid. So I kind of think it's like once you're a boys and girls club kid, you're always a boys and girls club kid. But now these kids are having kids and they're getting married and I you know, I'm feeling old. So now we come to the place. Uh, the place is the place for everyone. This is a joint partnership between Boys and Girls Club and Head Start. And we had started a um, a campaign or a feasibility study, a, a community groups. I think you were a part of these in the, you know, the early, yeah around 2004, 2005, and said, what is the plan? And that, am I moving around too much? I can go back Okay. And forth. <laughs> um, what is the plan for Boys and Girls Club of Rochester? We had purchased a home school in 2002. Two-thirds of it was condemned and unusable. So we had an agreement with the school district that we would tear down the unusable portions within five years. So we knew we needed to do something. And what we were trying to figure out is what? What is that something? And, and who does it make sense to partner with? And, and what's our next um, step for Boys and Girls Club? And Head Start quickly rose to the surface as a natural partner because we serve the same kids and families just at different ages and stages in their life. I should have mentioned earlier, in order to be a part of Head Start programming, you have to be at or below the federal poverty line, which for a family of four, that's a gross income of $22,000 a year. So you have to qualify to be a part of that program. Boys and Girls Club is really set up to serve kids who need us most. Right now, 93% of our kids, our membership, are receiving free and reduced meals. So we really are serving the same kids just as they get older. So we thought, my staff give me such a hard time for saying this. Wouldn't it be great if we could partner and really serve kids in a better way that makes most sense for this community and most sense for kids? So that's how this started. And it was really in those very early conversations that it was decided upon, this makes sense for Rochester's kids. Um, so we started the planning in 2005 to do this, um, kicked off the campaign in 2009 to fund this, I may have spoken to many of you, and if I haven't, I probably will, uh, about this campaign. Um, 
and we broke ground on the place uh, November of last year and we opened uh, September 30th of this year to serve kids. So it really has been remarkable. And I'll share a little bit more about that um, in a moment. So why is it necessary? Why do we continue to do what we do? Um, I know that uh, our, our missions continue to cross, uh, Boys and Girls Club Head Start and in Zumbra Luka, I know that you do the backpack program, sending food home for kids. Um, we do our own version of the backpack program in which we know kids are hungry, so we feed them. Um, if they need food, we send them home with food on the weekends. Um, you know, our food program at Boys and Girls Club started because kids were hungry. Uh, and when we noticed that kids were hungry, we asked them to bring a sack lunch, specifically in the summer because we're open 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., 10 hours a day. And uh, what we found was that kids were bringing uh, either nothing or not enough to feed them, or it was a bag of chips and a pop. Um, and it, certainly not healthy, nor is it enough to sustain them throughout the day. So we started a meal program very early on with a lot of community support. That meal program grew, and we serve about 45,000 meals and snacks a year. Uh, with the place, we now have a licensed kitchen in which to do it. Um, <laughs> we um, have relied on the community to provide so many of our meals. Um, but that's why it, you know, a part, part of that was necessary for us because of sheer needs. So there is a rapidly growing population of low-income children and youth in this community. Um, a lot goes unrecognized or unnoticed because it's not on the front page of the paper. Um, DMC is on the front page of the paper and all these really great things that Rochester has to offer. Um, but again, not everybody is living that reality. So we're going to do a little game, a little exercise. Let's see, everybody over here, could you please raise your hand? Everybody on this side of the room, raise it really, really high. These kids represent the amount of kids in the Rochester public school system that don't know where their next meal is coming from. 36% of kids in Rochester public schools receive free and reduced meals. 36% of 16,000 kids don't know where their next meal is coming from. To put that in perspective, when I moved here in 2008, 28% of kids were receiving free and reduced meals, and now that number is up to 36%. Um, and speaking with some People who work um, far more with numbers than I do have said with DMC and the increase of jobs, that number will continue to grow as well. What's my next one? So 90% of the fastest growing um, jobs will be the ones with the degrees. Uh, in the place where the old home school, the place is 87% of those lack a degree. It's really hard to be competitive in the workforce if you don't have the education, the skills in which to do it. When we were looking for a place to, to build the place, we had looked at a variety of locations and ultimately ended up where we were because Southeast Rochester in that area around homeschool is the highest need in the community. One of the things that we're required to do to receive federal funds from the Office of Justice Programs is we have to map out the areas and the kids in which we serve and we get rated on a community disadvantaged index. And it looks at poverty rates, education rates, um, rental units, um, what are the risk factors that could affect kids, crime rates, all of that stuff. And the site that we're located at on Center Street rates a 9 out of 10 on that disadvantage index. Now this is a national index, so this is against East LA, urban Chicago, New York City, all those places that you think about when you think about poverty and crime and all of those, those things. Okay, now this is the next one. Everybody raise your hand. Actually, everybody raise both of your hands. Okay. Every single one of your hands are living in transition as a kid. And I would triple that. Living in transition means you're homeless. It means you don't know where you're going to sleep that night, or you're sleeping in a hotel, or you're staying with a friend, or you're living with relatives. And this number continues to grow. And this is just for our school-age kids. Um, Head Start last year had 14 four-year-olds that were living in transition, meaning I don't know that I'm going to be here for much longer. We had a nine-year-old kid, um, one of my favorites. It's hard. You're not supposed to have favorites. Um, but I didn't learn that until I was a parent, so I, I have grace, right? Um, so this nine-year-old guy... Um, we, he had, we were touring the new superintendent, this was two years ago, and the superintendent had asked him, where are you going to school? And he just kind of shrugged it off and walked away. Come to find out, he didn't know where he was going to school because he didn't know where he was going to be living. He has gone through four different elementary schools in his short life. 
and he continues to get moved around and we've lost track of him. We can no longer find this kid. And Boys and Girls Club is certainly the best place for him because it's sustainable, it's consistent, he has expectations and he has people there who care about him. So that's why it's necessary for us to continue to be here. I'm not a doom and gloom type of person, so I don't mean to come down heavy this morning. I just know that there's um, a lot of information out there that as Rochester sometimes we're, we're not aware of. Oh, that's just a cute picture to make you go. Oh. <laughs> so this is what we're doing. Um, you know, as we talked about becoming partners and co-locating and knowing that we would be really good roommates in a facility, we decided to go through an exercise in which we wanted to determine where are the gaps in service, where do kids need us most, what's missing, um, and so we started with this. It's a lot of information, I don't expect you to read this all, if, if you really want it all, I can email it out to you, um, but what I want you to look at are just these two red circles or ellipses. Uh, what we had determined is that Head Start are really, really fantastic at working with kids, literally birth, um, they work with pregnant moms as well, all the way through pre-K. In Boys and Girls Club, we don't start serving kids until age six. So we work with kids from ages six to 18, and so clearly there's a big gap in either five-year-olds or kindergartners. The other really big gap is down at the bottom here with the whole family support. Head Start engages parents. They require parent involvement. Um, they have trainings. They, they teach parents how to be advocates for their children in the school system, all these really great things. Boys and Girls Club, we've always focused on the kid. Uh, we do not want any barriers for kids to participate, and sometimes when you require parent participation, there's a, a natural barrier there. So our hope is that we learn from Head Start, and as kids are already engaged, or parents, they continue to be engaged. So those are the two gaps. So as we looked at um, the place and the campaign and, and our response to the community about what kids need, these are two of our focus areas that we're looking at. And Erlene, if you want to pipe in about anything I'm saying, you're, you're welcome to do so. And again, oh, these are our two Head Start kids that are currently serving the facility. And these are some of our teens at the grandest opening. So as we look at this, you know, cradle to college, going on there. Cradle to college programming. I thought how cool that this group of kids get to stand with the mayor at the grandest opening with a key to the city. And how many times in their life will they get that opportunity again? So we, uh, I had mentioned earlier about being mission driven in a collaboration. So I just put up the definitions of collaboration because we talk about it a lot, or at least I do. And I say I collaborate and I partner with that. And I better look at what it actually means. And um, the one that I think I really like the most is number two, to cooperate with or willingly assist an enemy of one's country, and especially an occupying force. So yeah, clearly we're not enemies. We, um, you know, when we look at uh, other youth serving organizations and partners in the community, there's often this uh, sense of competition between each other. There's competition between Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, why, all of these other youth serving partners, and, and, and I absolutely disagree, and I would say most of our youth serving partners do as well, that we really complement each other. And the more things that there are for kids to do in this community, the better off our community is going to be. But what this is for us, it, it's more than just common goals. Um, when uh, Patrick Gannon, who is the Executive Director for Child Care Resource Referral, and I work through a problem, we are always focused on the mission and how do we serve kids better and how do we serve this community better. Because collaboration is not easy. It is certainly not the easiest way. The easiest way is to take your ball and go home because you don't like the rules. Um, so we have been very intentional at making sure that we work through this together and that we truly collaborate. There we are, standing in front of Pilar Roll. That's homeschool. Was homeschool. You can see a little sign back there that says, Welcome to homeschool. <laughs> um, what makes this so unique about the place is that this is a 50% joint ownership. So Head Start owns 50% of this facility, Boys and Girls Club owns 50% of this facility. There isn't one or more that owns it. Uh, we have formed an LLC that governs this. We have a very extensive 29 page joint venture agreement, light reading for anybody. Um, that tells us how we can and cannot operate. Uh, so this has been taken very seriously, and I can assure you that this is not happening around the country. When we started this project, we looked at other Boys and Girls Clubs, other Head Starts, other youth-serving organizations that have this kind of model, and it just isn't happening. And it's not happening because it's really hard work. 
Um, and when you get resources involved, um, it becomes really hard work. Um, and if I can speak on behalf of both of the boards, there was an agreement really early on that we're in this. And we are not going to be 50% and that I raise this dollar, you spent this dollar. It's we're all in. And we trust each other. We trust the leadership that we can make this work. And it really has. Um, both boards had decided early on that in order for us to go forth this project, we'd raise 70% of the funds. And before we broke ground, we raised 82% of the funds. So it was really impressive, and we're really proud of that. Did you want to say anything about the boards? No? OK. They are great boards, and we do a lot of things uh, jointly and in common. So as we were going through this process, um, I feel like I lost sight a little bit of why we were doing this. Uh, I was in so many meetings. I was in a lot of construction meetings. I was in a lot of finance meetings. I was in a lot of meetings about meetings, um, and I, I, you know, I wasn't with the kids, and I forgot what my service was. And I forgot where I should have been focused. And I came into work one morning, and I had this note on my desk. And this is from a young lady. I think her name is at the end, um, Charisma. And she had come up the night before in tears, talking to one of my staff and said, I can't believe you're tearing down the Boys and Girls Club. How could you do that? Um, what does she say? Please, 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 don't take away everything in the club. Can you just change the other side? We call the come down portion the other side. Um, I've not been here as long as the other kids, but I found a home here, and I can have friends. I can have fun here. A few more pleases. Um, she drew her own sketch of what she thought the Boys and Girls Club could look like. <laughs> or should look like. Um, uh, Miss Jody, if you're not one of these people, but just consider my feelings. And she's writing to me on her knee. Uh, and so I had called her up to my office the next day, and she had these big alligator tears running down her face, saying, how can you do this? I love this place. And I brought out the blueprints and the pictures of the new place and said, this is what we're going to do. We are creating a better place with bigger, and she loves the art space, with two art spaces, performing and visual, and all of these great things for you, for you to enjoy. And she kind of lifted her head, and her eyes lit up a little bit. For me? So, <laughs> Absolutely, that's why we're here, to make sure that you have a great place to go. It's going to be better. So, oh, yes, it is definitely going to be better than, than what we have now. And she's, you know, you could see her wheels kind of turning a little bit. And she said, you know what? I bet my grandma will let me come here a little bit more often because this place is pretty scary looking right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yes, I know. It is a little bit. So it brought me back to making sure that the kids are aware of what we're doing. You know, all too often we work on behalf of kids without including kids in the process. So we were very intentional. Our teen center, the color palette was picked by the teens. We brought in our design group to work with them. They've had feedback on, on how their spaces are set up and how they're designed. So instead of working um, uh, for them, we were working with them. So this was a moment of, oh yeah, Jody, slow down. <laughs> So uh, just a little bit, I don't know how I'm doing for time, Erlene. Okay, good. Um, this is a, should I, does anybody have any questions before I continue about club or Head Start or service? I just don't want to dump a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, this is about our campaign. Again, a lot of words, not expecting you to read them all. Uh, we had kicked off this campaign to raise $8 million to build the place which is this fantastic facility. We went from 14,000 usable square feet, and uh, again, two-thirds of it condemned, to 55,000 square feet. We're open 11 hours a day, and we are using every space in that club. <laughs> Somebody asked me, well, do you have space for a, a stage that you could put in there? And I said, we really don't. You have 55,000 square feet. How can you not have space for a stage? And we've just really programmed um, all of it right now. Uh, so we had raised uh, 6.2 million towards that goal before we had broken ground on the facility. And again, during that time, we started to revise our, our, our focus a little bit and wanted to focus so much more on the future than where we thought we could be at. And that's when we came up with this integrated service plan, the one with the gaps in service. How can we really serve kids together instead of Head Start serve kids, go through Head Start programs, and then Boys and Girls Club serve kids? How can we make sure that you could start in Head Start programming when you're born and continue with it in this continuum all the way through college or career readiness. 
So we revised our campaign. Uh, so we kicked off at the Granite's opening a $3 million campaign to help us do that. Uh, just under a million of that will be to service the debt on the facility or pay that off rather, so we will be completely debt free. Uh, and then the other $2 million is to really integrate programming. So to plan how to do this, because nobody's doing this, we just don't know what to do or what to expect. We have some assumptions. Uh, we have really great data on how to serve kids, but really this continuum, it just isn't being done. So we're making some really great guesses and projections on how we're going to do that, and we want to bring in some experts to help us do that as well. We really want to make sure that resources and time and energies are spent in the best way possible. Um, so that would be a, a portion of it. And then creating new outcomes. You know, if you were to ask anybody in Rochester, you know, what do you want to see for a kid growing up in Rochester, I think everybody has a little bit of a different idea. I would say all of us want kids to be successful. We want them to be happy. We want them to be healthy. We want them to contribute back, you know, continue with service to, to community and the greater good. So what are those outcomes? How do you know that we're achieving that? Is it by a kid who now works at Minnesota Department of Transportation? Or are there some real data points along there that we can start collecting to know that what we're doing is successful? So we've talked about capacity, how many more kids can we serve, what are the needs out there, and really asking um, for some funds in order to help us get there. Since we kicked off this campaign, we are $300,000 closer to our goal. Which is real. I know, it's exciting, isn't it? Uh, we. Um, what we have found with building of the place is that people think, okay, this is really happening. Um, I know that when we had talked a lot about this, people would say, come back to me when the building is built. Yeah, come back to me when you know, this thing is really happening. And now we can say it's really happening and we're really excited. We had some great support really early on. Mayo Clinic had invested $650,000 to make this come, um, dream come to reality. Think Bank had invested $500,000. Um, and some other really um, big investments along the way. And we also used a, a financing model called New Market Tax Credits, which again, if you're ever um, bored on a Saturday night, I'll give you the reading materials, but basically it's a, a federal funding program that helped us bring three and a half million dollars into this community for this project. Um, so these are new dollars that we didn't raise from this community, but in the process had uh, new jobs, had created 28 new jobs for people. Um, Head Start brings in an additional $1.7 million a year in their programs into this community. So we really do see ourselves as part of the growing economy of Rochester, not just by getting kids ready, but by being an employer, uh, by being a really great place to work, and being a part of the commerce of this as well. So we are kicking this off and have kicked it off. Um, if you haven't gotten information, and actually we have information today to share with you on this as well. So I was just going to share a few slides with you about the place um, and a little bit about the programming that happens in there. Now, Boys and Girls Club, in order to be a member, you have to be between the ages of 6 and 18 years old. There are no requirements outside of that. You do not have to be income eligible. You do not have to be referred. Um, I was just touring with a woman from legal assistance and she said, what? Anybody can come? I said, my kid's a Boys and Girls Club kid. She loves going there. You don't have to, you know, there's no requirements. I said, no. She said, why doesn't everybody use it? I said, that's a really great question. Uh, we are $25 a year to be a member. So you come in um, as a parent or a child, pay the membership fee, and you get all that that has to offer, our field trips, our academic support our meal program, all of that. So we really do rely on the generosity of the community to make sure that we can continue to serve um, all of our programs. So this is the main entrance. Um, this used to be uh, the basketball court in the parking lot of the old home school. And what I would really encourage all of you is to come in for a tour. It really is a remarkable space. Oh, good. See, and this is why she's great. If you'd like to take a tour, just put your name on here. I've got some dates. This is our gymnasium. <clears throat> what we had committed to oh, hey, was building a really great gymnasium um, that not only kids wanted to be in, but the community wanted to be in as well. Uh, you know, Our operating costs are clearly going to go up in this new facility, so we wanted to build a space that would maybe be rentable to the community to help offset some facility costs. When I look at this gymnasium, so in my time in Boys and Girls Club, I have been in a recycled church, 
uh, an old two-bedroom apartment in a low-income housing project. I was in an old dairy creamery. And our gymnasium was an old garage where the trucks used to pull in and fill up with the cream and then pull up the other end. So we cinder blocked off the ends. And that was our, our garage, or not a garage, that was our gymnasium. So I look at it as, you know, as a kid, maybe getting a, a used pair of sneakers from, you know, the Goodwill of the Salvation Army to a brand new pair of Nike Air Jordans. And what that does for your self-esteem and your self-worth to be in such a fantastic space. Um, so this is our new gymnasium. This is our discovery zone, which is um, for our younger kids, for our members that are ages six through eight who like to play Legos on the floor and cars and uh, making sure that that's done in a very safe space. These chalkboards here are from the old home school. So we try to um, keep as much uh, integrity of the old space as possible. When we had started building this facility, uh, we had been told that um, the, the, the two thirds of it needed to be um, torn down because it was unusable. We had done our own assessment of this facility and found out that a major part of it was still very usable and we saved about two and a half million dollars through that process. So this was considered unusable. This is our academic success center. Um, this is where our academic support programs happen. Uh, we are partners with the school district and one of the things that we are allowed access to is Skyward. Um, Skyward is the school district's online academic monitoring system. Each kid gets a username and ID and it shows their attendance, um, how they're do missing homework assignments, um, their grades, behaviors, all of that. And so with parent permission, we now get to access our kids' academic records. So if Erlene comes into the club and I say, hey Erlene, you get your math homework done? And she goes, of course, Jody, I'm done. I'll say, let's check. I just want to be sure. And so I can check and see if Erlene's missing anything. And if she is, I can call or email the teacher and say, hey, send that over so we can help her get it done. Not shame on you, Erlene, for not getting it done, but how can I help you better? Because sometimes that support just doesn't exist at home. Sometimes the technology doesn't exist at home. So we can do that here. And the best part is we can do it in real time instead of when that grade is reported as failing because then it's too late. So we get to help advocate for kids in the school system. This is our main lobby, our, um, our welcome area. Um, the space up to the right is our, um, our games room, which is really a crown jewel of any boys and girls clubs. You know, when kids walk into the club, it's rarely because they're looking to get their character developed. <laughs> I haven't had anybody come in and say, Jody, could you please shape my life today? Um, they come in because it's fun. And so in that space, there's pool tables, there's table tennis, there's video games, there's beanbag chairs. I mean, it's a really fun space to get kids into the club. Uh, we are open almost 1,700 hours a year. We're open Monday through Friday, 3 until 8 p.m. And then in the summer and on non-school days from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So kids are with us a huge chunk of the time if, if they choose to do so. This is a Head Start classroom. There are 10 Head Start classrooms. They serve about 230 kids a day at this site. They also do in-home care and they also do in-school care. So they're serving between four and 500 kids um, in the community every single day. There are uh, morning sessions and afternoon sessions. Um, so these classrooms are designed dependent on the age of kids in which they're serving. Again, because they are literally birth through pre-K, there are infant rooms, there are toddler rooms, there are older kid rooms, and they're designed specifically for that. Previously, Head Start was in the lower levels of three churches. While great um, that they were able to use these spaces, they weren't designed to be Head Start spaces. Again, that whole do what you can with what you have where you are mentality. Um, uh, they graciously use these spaces, but this is the first time Head Start has had classrooms designed for their needs. And what that means for kids is if they are moving or if they are in transition, instead of being taken out of a classroom in Northwest and being moved to a classroom in Southeast because your family has moved there, they change a bus route and they stay in the same peer group. They stay with the same teachers. They have that sustainability, that consistency of care, which especially at that early age is so important. That's just a picture of you. Aww. That's Luke, one of our club kids. Oh, and thank you. I guess that's it. Um, so that, again, a lot of information. I do, uh, there is some information early that we had set aside that looks like this. This is a packet, a brochure about the place and the joint programming, the great things that we're doing. There is a bag of those. 
On the chair in the back, the oh, red bag. Yeah, please grab something out of the red bag. Um, inside, I just want to explain what these are. There are two donation envelopes. Um, I like to joke around that people are typically not in my presence for more than, well, it's probably closer to 45 minutes. It used to be an hour with all me asking for something. Um, I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to ask you to consider if you were thinking about investing in the community during this holiday season, here's a really great opportunity to do so. But there are two envelopes in there, and I just wanted to explain so as not to confuse you know, Boys and Girls Club has about a $1.1 uh, $1 million budget. We rely on the generosity of others. Uh, many of you already invest in what we do. Thank you. You know, Please consider continue doing that. That's what this one is, and it says Boys and Girls Club. This one is specifically to support the place, so if you are so inclined to do so, that's what this one is, and it goes to both organizations as well. So I just wanted to explain that. And coincidentally, a little pen that I think complements these quite nicely. <laughs> So thank you for your time this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Jody. Um, yes, we have uh, time for questions, about 15 minutes, but I wanted to share with you that uh, a woman from our congregation toured the club, or the place, I can't stop saying the club, so excuse me, um, and she said, you know, I'd love to volunteer here. Um, she says, but I don't know what I could do. And I said, is she here this morning? Oh, no, she she's here a lot. I said, can you listen to kids read? And she said, yeah, I, I can do that. I said, can you read to kids? She said, yeah, I can do that. And she said, and I know sign language, too. So, <laughs> so I said, you, you can really, you know, help a lot of kids by just coming and doing that. And one of the times that I was at the club, I was just there waiting for energy of young people there, waiting for a meeting. And these two kids came up to the desk, and they said, could Michelle come down and, and read with us? And I knew Michelle, she works in the office, and that she, that she was busy. So I said, well, I can listen to you read. And the little boy said, no, I want Michelle. <laughs> and the little girl said, you can read with me. And I said, OK, pick out a book. So she picked out a book, and she sat down. And I said, it was cars. And they were like one sentence on a page. I said, um, can you read for me? No, you read. I said, okay, I'll read the first page, you read the second page. And by then, two other little girls came and huddled by me. And so I read the first page. And I said, your turn. She goes, no, you read it. And the other little girl says, I'll, I'll read it. So she read it. And then I realized that she couldn't read. And so by the end of the book, we all took turns and and we incorporated her by talking about the colors and that kind of thing. She's a second grader at Bamboo Valley School. And because of her life situation, she was getting her help for reading at the club and supporting what the education system does. So you can be a big help. You don't have to even spend a long time, but you can be a big help. So um, volunteering at the club is just an awesome way to be blessed in return for your service. So think about that. Come and see. Questions? Well, you mentioned that there was a $25 uh, fee for, uh, is that per family or for each child? Because I'm thinking of a family with four, five, six, that's a considerable amount of money for somebody who has problems even finding money for food. No, that's a great question. It is $25 per kid. We do provide scholarships. In order to be eligible, we just have to show that there is some need. So if you're receiving free and reduced meals in school, then they, we provide scholarships as well. We do ask that there, you know, the, the fee is nominal. It's that buy-in. Uh, you know, if something costs nothing, the perceived value is nothing. So we ask for that buy-in, but do provide scholarships uh, as, as long as they can you know, show us that there's certainly a need for it. Can I share a quick story about that? There was a young guy who was about 12 years old, and his parents weren't able to pay his membership fee, and we were $10 at the time. And they weren't able to pay it, and I said, that's fine, we'll absolutely provide a scholarship, but you're going to have to earn it, and you get to work with me in the kitchen to earn it. And so he would help me scrub the floors and take out the trash and, you know, that thing, and we did that for about a week so he could earn his card. And one day, um, he had some behavior issues. He was sent up to my office to talk to me because he had tried to choke a kid. I said, oh my gosh, you know, why, why 
why would you do that? And he said, Jody, I was sitting at the table and I was playing a game and I had knocked my card on the floor with my elbow by accident. And that kid came by and stepped on my card. I worked so hard for that card. I can't believe he would do that. And I said, I get it. I understand you're upset. You can't go after a kid like that. Stop it. <laughs> or you can't come to club, period. And he got it. But it was just that value that he had worked so hard for something. So, yeah, great question. But we, we want to make sure that there are no, no barriers to access our programs. So, if you contribute, can you contribute specifically to the scholarship fund? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. I know that some of the kids that you serve, I know some of them personally, and I know some of them have some pretty complicated issues with social skills and behavior. Mm -hmm. So what kind of training are you able to give your staff to help them deal with that? No, that's a great question too. And you know, we are what's considered non-custodial care, so we are not licensed daycare, we are not governed by the same regulations. We have a variety of trainings for our staff. We have both full-time and part-time, um, also supplemented by volunteers. So we have social services and human services come in and talk to us about what does mandated reporting look like. Um, if we're not competent or qualified, we do refer kids on. Sometimes we're not the best place for kids. I mean, we have to say that, quite honestly, we're not social workers. Um, you might be better served having a one-to-one -one or, or a different, lo different level of care. We do some nonviolent crisis intervention. We do effective guidance and discipline. So we do have a variety. Of, of trainings um, that we can offer as well and some of it is truly experience knowing what makes kids tick and that relationship that we build with kids um, you know, through my time I know that I am not the best person to work with all kids because of my personality or their home life um, we have um, you know, little girls that don't work well with our male staff for a variety of reasons and knowing that helps us be more successful yeah. a lot of times too the programs that the Boys and Girls Club of America has uh, teaches staff. We have a program specifically for girls. We have a um, manhood, what's that one? Passport to manhood. Passport to manhood that's specifically for boys. And um, staff learn from those programs when, you know, when they incorporate them into the daily programming as well. This training. Harlan, can you catch? He's closer. He is. I, I, as I listen, it, it's great. And I've driven by and it's been fun to see it go up. Uh, obviously, to me, you have partnerships with the school district. Uh, I would imagine perhaps some of the churches and religious communities in the area where you team up. Uh, what sort of limitations do you have placed on your, your operation with respect to some of those other uh, service organizations in the school district and what opportunities do they look forward to to say there's no boundaries let's just go at this well you know we started looking at that a couple of years ago about what does partnership actually mean um, and sometimes partnership means that we're going to do things together or we're going to otherwise a partnership can mean we're going to receive a service or a benefit from that. Um, we, tru we truly have tried to make things a partnership and that we're both receiving some benefit or good from that. So that certainly is a limitation because sometimes the capacity isn't there for that to happen, uh, both on our side or our partnering organization side. Um, and we have to make sure that it's in the best interest of kids. You know, we'll have people that want to partner with us and, and bring in underwater basket weaving, which might be a really great passion of the underwater basket weaving group, but certainly kids might not want to participate in that. So that's not a partnership that we would necessarily be interested in, or nor would our kids be interested in. Um, so there are the, the biggest limitations are resources. Do we have staff dedicated that can work with that partnership to make sure that it's truly successful? Do we have the space to do it? Do we have the money to do it if there's any you know, financial resources involved? Um, if we feel like it is truly going to be beneficial, then, then it's, it's limitless or boundaryless for us. Um, and there have been a few of those. You know, our work in the school district, uh, we have staff in three middle schools, and that's a financial resource for us. But the benefit is that we are connecting kids that aren't connected already and that um, may, as they like to say, slip through the cracks. Um, opportunities? Boy, I think there's lots of opportunities. <laughs> Again, my staff hate it when I say, wouldn't it be great if, and how can we make this happen? And, you know, our greatest opportunities are having um, caring adults connect with kids. 
and that consistency. Um, you know, we do a variety of mentoring as well, but it's having that same connectedness, that same adult role model, um, just showing kids that they have somebody they can connect with that cares about them. Um, yeah, I guess that's the easy way, the easy answer. I don't know if that was helpful, but that certainly would be something that we're always looking for. A couple partnerships that we developed that came out of that original uh, task force eight years ago was one with the police liaison officer. Mm -hmm. So we have an office in the building for the neighborhood police liaison and then a public health. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a couple that support both programs. There are presence for parents and in the neighborhood. And uh, so I think those are two great ones. And anytime there's an opportunity, we'll look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we're looking at one right now with, well, maybe we shouldn't say because well, it's in the studying stage. <laughs> but there are opportunities. So don't hesitate to have dialogue. Mm -hmm. Another question. OK. Three of them here. I'll start here. Sure. Hi, Jody. Hi, Merlin. Um, could you comment more on whatever it is you know about the students as they've grown up and passed on into adult life? Uh, what are they doing? Um, whatever you know. Um, yes. You know, some of them have been very challenging to stay in touch with. Um, others have been very successful and continue to give back. Um, one of our, our kids, she was Youth of the Year. Oh, when was Iris Youth of the Year? Oh, that was back when I was at the club, so 2003, four. Yeah, you yeah, know, she was a, a, a pregnant teen, um, of course, a teen mom, and had gone to school and now has just graduated from, well, she's at St. Kate's, she was working for Regents Hospital, um, and uh, now she has gotten her, I think, her, her RN, her LPN, and she is working in the PEDS unit at Regents. And I think she wants to go on and be a nurse practitioner as well. Yeah. But yeah, I haven't connected with her for a while, but we have lots of stories like that. And you know, she's she's one of them. She used to bring her little baby to club with her and um, yeah. Yeah. So although I don't have the stats, which is something that I would like to be able to do, and as we talk about this continuum of care, we just don't have a system in place to track our alum and to know what they're doing, how many are successful, and how many continue to give back. Um, it's something that we'd like to be able to do. We have stories, but I, I certainly don't have anything that says X percent um, you know, are able to go on. We're in a partnership right now with Boys and Girls Clubs of America called the National Youth Outcomes Initiative in which they're putting systems in place to help us do that. So they're actually helping us collect our data, analyze it, and give it back to us in a presentable form. So that's going to be a piece of that as well. Another thing I'd say about the Youth of the Year that you might not know is these kids do get scholarships. Mm -hmm. So there are many places in the community, if you were at the Heroes Breakfast, there were three of them given out that day mm -hmm. to the Youth of the Year. So it actually gives them more than just a leg up in getting to college, uh, but some money to do it. Pat? Uh, if you volunteer, is there parking there? Is there parking for volunteers? There is parking. We do not have as much parking as we would like to have, which always seems to be an issue. Um, but yeah, we can make sure that the, it's accessible as well. Where, where is it? The parking? We have a parking lot. Parking yeah. lot. Yep, yep. There used to be a house and a vacant lot there. It's now a parking lot right on the grounds. Yeah. Hi. Hi there. You talk a lot about kids and that is your focus. What kind of interaction do you ever have with parents um, to maybe refer them to some services which really benefit the kids in the long run? That's a great question. Uh, we build relationships with parents in uh, a variety of ways. We have very regular um, family get together so we'll do family meals where parents are welcomed in as well. We do parent um, nights in which parents are welcome to come into the club and start building in those relationships. Um, if referrals are needed, we do work directly with the parents. We don't want any surprises. I mean, as a parent, I want to know what's going on in my child's life, good and bad. Uh, we do events like our terrific kids events in which we uh, give kids awards for being terrific in a variety of ways and invite parents into that as well. So it's much more of a grassroots effort to get to build relationships with parents so we're trusted. You know, so many of the families that we work with are in the system and are systemed out. They're paperworked out and those provide barriers for kids to access us. Um, so we try to make it as easy as possible for parents to get engaged. I think you mentioned early on that as, as DMC continues to roll mm -hmm. out that you're expecting that the need will also increase. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about 
why that expectation exists. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, we had worked with um, Phil Wheeler from Olmstead County and he was looking at demographics of how things were going to change and, and I don't know the exact stats so I'm not going to pretend but it was some exorbitant amount of low income people moving into this community because of DMC because it's the land of opportunity um, and they say for every high paying job there's like seven or nine support positions that are coming along with that. So although so many families are working they're just not working livable wages. Um, so that those needs continue to grow. In, in 19, I think it was 93 when Rochester was named by Money Magazine as the best place to live in America. If you ask the chief of police at the time, he'll say, that's when we saw an increase in some of these issues because people do see this as a land of opportunity and may not have the same expectations as the rest of the community. So that's where some of that's coming from as well. Although Roslyn might be one of those pre people our youth of the year this year, she moved here from Chicago with mm -hmm. her mom and a sister and a brother. Yep, yep. And um, we see a lot of that where they come here because there are some of those support level jobs in the community that, that are better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So other questions? You have been an awesome audience. Um, I, I might say that um, when we were having our dialogue and our listening sessions when we were about to call Pastor Lisa, one of the gentlemen in the group I was in said, you know, maybe we should focus our resources on having a program here at Zumbro for kids because there's so many kids that need us. And I wish I would have taken his name that night because I wanted to take him to the club and say, you know, it's here and it's really expensive and takes a lot of hard work to sustain a program like that that can really make a difference in the lives of kids. And so I'd just like to leave you with the thought that the reason, another reason why I serve in this capacity is because we don't have to do everything ourselves. We don't have to start a new program because there's a need. There are a lot of programs in our community, and Boys and Girls Club is just one of them, um, where we can support that kind of work and make a difference in their lives. So thank you for coming, and um, I hope I'll grab the other uh, tour sheet and if one of these times didn't work, call me anytime. Many of you have said, I want to take a tour. Karen, you've had a tour. Anyone else had a tour? Raise your hand if you've already had a tour. Great. Um, tell others about it, too, so we can show you what we're doing firsthand. Come when there's kids there, by the way. Yes, please. Thank you, Jody. Thank you. Thank it was a pleasure. Much. Thank you. Happy holidays. Come back next week. Jan Better will talk to us about.